America in the 1920s was a country poised for a fresh start. The horrific brutality of the first global war was over. The economy was beginning to roar. And the presidents at the helm were happy to take a back seat to Congress. But as America crashed into depression, and then another world war, the times called for a stronger leader, one who set the table for presidential power in the 20th century. It is the office of the president that most embodies the hopes and aspirations of the American people. It's a position invested with great power that is defined by challenges and crises, by the burden of the past and visions of the future, and by the personalities of the 43 men who have become president. A story of America can be told through the ultimate guide to the presidents. November 2nd, 1920. In a shack on the roof of a building in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, five men read the presidential election returns. They were receiving live updates from a local newspaper office and sharing them via radio as far away as Canada. It was the first live election results program and the first presidential election in which women cast their votes. The stakes were high. The direction of the nation hung in the balance. If I can compare the American body politic to the American body, Americans by 1920s were tired of dieting. They were tired of the progressive reforms, of the sacrifices that presidents demanded to them. They had been dieting for 20 years. They wanted to go back to what they perceived as an older time. Unpopular global entanglements, a post-war economic collapse, and labor strikes in major industries. For many Americans, there was too much effort, too little reward. Republicans seized on the people's apathy, thrusting conservative Ohio Senator Warren Harding into the spotlight. During one of his campaign speeches, Warren Harding said, it's time for normalcy. And this idea of return to normalcy really resonated in American politics. Harding's promise to return the nation to normalcy was really a rejection of progressivism the belief that, that the nation should not be governed from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. In many ways, it's a return to the 19th century model of the presidency, the idea that the Congress will pass laws, that business will make money, and the president will just mind his own business. Harding was an easygoing everyman. A former newspaper man from Ohio, the 55-year-old senator was known for never taking sides or making firm stands on an issue. He wanted to please everybody, and usually did. Harding was a Ohio good old boy, as opposed to being the Professor Wilson or the Superman Roosevelt. He was just some guy who would get together, play cards in his shirt sleeves. He was affable, he was non-threatening, and he came from Ohio, which was a critical state. I mean, what other qualifications do you need to be president? The Democratic candidate was also from Ohio, its governor, James Cox. He chose a young Franklin Delano Roosevelt as his running mate, but the ticket's allegiance to reform now seemed out of touch with the times. Progressivism was out and conservatism was in. Harding and his running mate Calvin Coolidge won in a landslide. They captured 37 of the 48 states and 60% of the popular vote. Harding wins an amazing victory. And what will he then do with his mandate? He wants to restore party rule, which meant that the Congress and the House and the Senate and the White House would work together and build a consensus. As the 29th president, Harding was happy to take a step back and let Republicans who dominated Congress by a three to one margin initiate policy. His administration pushed for a more streamlined government, cutting taxes, clamping down on unions, and having the Federal Reserve raise interest rates. 
And where men like Roosevelt and Wilson had dictated to their cabinet, Harding let his have free reign. He has no vision for the job. He doesn't know how to do the job. He was talking to his secretary and said, John, you know, I've got this tax problem, and I know there's somebody that can explain these issues to me, but I don't know who he is. Eventually, he just turns it over to his subordinates to run the nation, and they blotch it. They put people out of work. Their unemployment rose terribly. In fact, it was 20% in some cities some weeks. It was a bad recession, the recession of the early 20s. Harding was able to escape much public criticism through his talent at courting the press. He took reporters out on the golf course and invited them to join him on vacation. He made time to appear in newsreels and cannily placed himself next to some of the biggest celebrities of the day. Harding was a warm and gracious man. He loved showing people around the White House. He used to stay up late at night and write letters to citizens who had written him. He lamented at one point, it's the only fun he has being president. Harding's off-hours habits became more well-known than his work days. Nights at the White House were described as being like a frat party with rooms filled with cigar smoke and whiskey. This is prohibition, and the president was expected to convey a certain sense of dignity. Playing poker, having a couple of, of, of shots during prohibition, these stories get out. One rumor even said that Harding gambled away the White House China. But Harding's hands-off approach to leadership was a gamble that was only paying off for his staff. Harding said that he, he could deal with his enemies, but he said, it's my friends, it's my goddamn friends that have me walking in the floors at night. The biggest scandal of the Harding administration was a teapot dome scandal. And this involved the Department of Interior. The Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, was one of Harding's Ohio gang cronies, going back to the president's days as a senator. What he had done was sell out oil, Navy oil reserves, to a couple of uh, big oil men. He was the first cabinet member to ever go to jail. Harding paid a price for giving up control of his administration to his cabinet. Much like what happened in President Grant's administration, some cabinet members couldn't resist using their unfettered power for personal gain. Probably the worst was the guy named Charles Forbes. Forbes proceeds to loot the Veterans Administration to the tune of like $100 million in 1920 dollars. There's a story that Harding called Forbes into the White House one day and like started to strangle him, just screaming at him and told him to get out. He besmirched the presidency through his association with corrupt people, but he was not an evil man himself. He was just weak. Harding tried to deflect attention from the scandals by going on a very public, months-long tour of the Western states, including the first presidential trip to Alaska. His efforts came to an abrupt end in San Francisco. He gets up there, and it's like, oh, I don't feel good. They think he's gotten some bad crab, OK, some bad seafood. And what he's had is a heart attack. Harding died on August 2nd, 1923, at age 57. His sudden death prevented any chance at repairing his image, that of a weak executive who did little to enhance the office of the president 